Hey everyone, I'm Evan Real. Welcome to In Studio today with Gloria Calderon Kellett, the co creator and co showrunner of Netflix's One Day at a Time. How's it going? It's going so good. So I'm good. I'm so excited to be here. Season three is finally here. How does it feel? Oh my gosh. It feels so good because we make them and then it takes like six months before the world sees them. Yeah. So it's very exciting to finally be released. I it. cannot wait to watch it. Well, here we are three seasons in. What were your expectations for the show when you first started out on this project and how has the series lived up to those expectations? I really felt a tremendous responsibility to do justice to the Latinx family. Yeah. Like for me growing up, I would watch shows like Growing Pains and Cosby Show and Family Ties and I would see myself through that lens. Mm -hmm. So to be able to finally put a Latino family on television, I really wanted to infuse it with all of those good feelings that I yeah, saw growing up. Yeah, absolutely. And for those who don't know, One Day at a Time, it is, it, it's a take on One Day at a Time from the 70s, Norman right. Lear's show, That's right. who's also involved in this project. What was it like adapting that blueprint through the lens of the Alvarez family for a Latinx family? Well, there's so much pressure because Norman Lear, if you guys don't know who Norman Lear is, really Google Norman. He is really like, basically invented TV. <laughs> At one point, he had nine like shows on the air at the same time. So many time. hits. And groundbreaking work. Not like silly feel-good shows, but grounded, talking about real issues. I mean, he had a character on a sitcom have an abortion. Unbelievable. It's pretty huge. Huge. And, and controversial and talking about real issues that American families were facing with comedy. And that was just, he was the first of his, uh, of his kind, really. And so we had this tremendous legacy, Mike Royce and I, to not mess up the Lear legend. You know, like, oh, here it is. You get to redo this show that was groundbreaking in 1975. It was the first time a divorced woman had been on TV. Can you believe it? 1975. Insane. So here he's giving us, like, the keys to the kingdom, and so we just didn't want to let him down. Right, and you obviously continued in that spirit. You're tackling huge issues like immigration, gender equality, homophobia. The list really goes on and on. Why do you think comedy is the most effective way to tackle issues like that? Well, I think it's, it feels less browbeating. It feels like you can enter someone's home and they can watch it with their families yeah. and they can laugh and they can cry and they can think about what the issues are that we're talking about and hopefully carry on that conversation in their home. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, now, uh, it, the show is obviously a vehicle for activism. Was that part of the appeal when you signed on to do the series? No, not really. I think it was, I mean, look, I'm a West Coast Latina. I'm a West Coast Cuban. I am liberal. Yeah. Uh, but I am also somebody who really feels like there is a divide in this country right now mm -hmm. and we need to have conversation. And so I have a lot of very conservative family members and we talk about issues and fight and still love each other. Right. And I thought, oh, that's really interesting. And if we can have those conversations on our show, maybe we can bridge some some gaps that are happening right now. Absolutely. I feel like a really good represent, representation of that was Elena's coming out story. We had so many different opinions, but there was, at the end of the day, there was so much love. Yeah, and that's ultimately the thing. We really try to come to it with a lens of love and acceptance. And to see, you know, the Latinx journey uh, in this country is very fraught, especially right now, because there is not a narrative that really is positive and supportive in many television shows. We're 18% of the country, 6% represented on screen, and yet that representation is still often gangbangers and drug dealers, et cetera. So to be able to show a family that is struggling but hardworking and kind, going through things like a daughter coming out, something that right. simple, and the different emotions, how some people are afraid for her, how some people have their own homophobia from growing up very religious and how they come to terms with that, how a mother is struggling to be, she thought she'd always be accepting and then here's her daughter yeah. and what, oh my God, now I have all these conflicting feelings. Um, what is this going on inside of me? So to be able to talk about all, of, and then the brother who doesn't care. Yeah. He's like, oh, you're gay, great. You right. know. So it was so awesome to have this opportunity to have all those conversations and hopefully make people feel seen. Like, mm -hmm. oh, that's me, but I can still come to this from a place of love. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> the cast is full of wonderful Latin actors, including the sensational Rita Moreno, Lydia, a.k.a. Abuelita. Um, but I know that representation behind the scenes is also really important for yes. you. You have a writer's room that is half Latinx, half 
female. We're actually more female than male now. Wow. Yeah. I love that. And so we have three queer writers, too. we got to give oh, love hey. to our queer writers. Always. <laughs> <laughs> now, how did you assemble that writer's room, and why was that so important to you? It was thoughtfully put together. You know, the, uh, very often in comedy writer's rooms, it's very male and very white male. And I like white guys. I married one. It's all good. <laughs> But when you're telling these types of stories, uh, equity is important. Mm -hmm. And so we really knew that we wanted it to be very female. It's, it's a matriarchy, this show. Yeah. We have good men, too. But we wanted very strong women. And we also really wanted queer voices. We thought that mm -hmm. was very important to genuinely tell this coming out story. Right. Uh, and then, obviously, Latinx. And so we have various Latinx. We have Cubans and Salvadorians and Mexicans and... Uh, Puerto Ricans, we, we're all in there. So if it's relatable to all of us, it tends to be something that goes in the script. Right, I love that. Now you were a writer on Devious Maids, which a lot of people considered a huge win for Latin representation on screen. How did that experience compare to the work you do at One Day at a Time? Is there something you learned working on that show that has transferred over? Well, I took that show, Mark Cherry came to me uh, and said, I want to do five Latina women as leads of a show. Okay. Is groundbreaking yeah. for American television. And at that time, it was ABC for ABC, so we thought it was going to be on ABC Network. Uh, and then it ended up being sold to Lifetime. It was incredible. Yeah. It was incredible doing Devious Maids because it was the first time that there were five Latina leads with Rosalind Sanchez, Judy Reyes, Ana Ortiz, Eddie Ganem. Um, it was just such an, and Dania as well. They're, they're just incredible women. And so that was really, really great, but it wasn't my voice. It was Mark's. Mark Cherry, the wonderful right. Mark Cherry, who's hilarious and wonderful. But he has his own point of view. Yeah. And I really got to see, like, oh, if I want to do my own thing, I've got to write it and I've got to be the voice of it. And here you are, doing your I own am. thing. Yeah. <laughs> um, the show is such a beautiful portrayal of the Latinx experience. My grandmother was for, from Colombia, so I found myself, I, or I continue to find myself relating to the show in such a personal way. And going back to what you were saying about how there's so many different Latin experiences in the writer's room, did you find that your ch like childhoods, your you know, growing up, did those experiences sort of match up? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I found what, what I found really interesting, because I think the Latin diaspora in this country, we are very um, singular in how we feel about our own culture, right? Mm. Cubans and Puerto Rican, everyone's like, we have our own thing, we have our own foods, we have our own things. But there's a lot of things that trickle. Yeah. And I think what often happens is people really want that Latin market. Mm -hmm. So they try to like make it all sort of even. Like we're going to mm. do sort of a pan-Latin thing. Okay. And when you do a pan-Latin thing, it kind of dilutes it too much. So we felt like let's get really specific with mm -hmm. the Cuban experience. And the more specific we got, the more we realized those specificities were universal yeah. amongst Latinx culture. So it was this kind of wonderful thing. Like we're gonna be super, we're gonna talk about Vicks Vapor Rub because this is how we feel about it. And then the Puerto Ricans and then the Dominicans. My, my like, tia Elena was obsessed with the Vicks Vapor it, Rub. Listen, it was the cure all for everything. I dare you to put that on your feet when you're <laughs> sick and put a sock on and wake up not well. I dare you. It always works. It, it honestly always works. does. I, I dare you. Or just like even all the little sayings said throughout, like pobrecito or ay carajo, like everything just felt so relatable, oh, which I absolutely loved. So yeah. it's really cool that everyone's experience sort of linked up. And like you said, the more specific you got, the more universal it, it was got. That's amazing. That is so cool. Um, now tell me about your process when you're coming up with issues and topics to tackle. Is there a strategy? Is, do you map out the episodes or is it more fluid? We really do map it out. We talk about, uh, the wonderful thing about being on Netflix is we know we have 13 episodes. Mm -hmm. So we arc it. We do think like, this is where the characters start, this is where we'd like them to end, and then here's some things we want them to talk about throughout. Okay. And we do kind of think about it in that umbrella term. What is this season about? What are we, what, each of these characters are gonna go on a journey. What is that journey? Mm -hmm. And in terms of like the topics, we never really think like, What's, what topic are we gonna talk about? It's really, what are we talking about? Right. What are we as women talking about? What are we as La Latinos talking about? What are we as queer people talking about in the room? Mm -hmm. What are we as parents talking about, right. right? And so we'll infuse it with all of that. This is what's happening with my kid. This is what's happening with my brother. This is what's happening, you know, like the, uh, we did a, an episode season two on colorism mm -hmm. based on my brother called me and he's much darker than I am. Same, my and brother he, looks very much Colombian. I, do not. You do not. Yeah. <laughs> no. No. And I, sometimes people are like, are you Italian? I'm like, no, I'm a Latina. Uh, but my brother's very dark and yeah. he's in San Diego, like on a beach with his kids. And somebody told him to go back to Mexico. And I was like, what? Insane. 
So we were talking about that in the room, and, and we were talking about colorism, and we thought we should do an episode about that. That's something not really discussed a lot mm -hmm. in the Latinx community. And it's it became one of the episodes that people talked about the most. Yeah. Is there an episode or a topic the show has covered that has felt particularly meaningful to you, like above all the episodes? Is there one that really sticks out? I really feel like, not yet for me, which is the finale of season two, uh, I just loved the play of it. Mm -hmm. You know, Norman is such a great lover of theater, as am I, and that just was a live play. Everyone yeah. had a monologue. It felt like that, for sure. And it was one room. I mean, you just can't do that on many shows. Yeah. And it also gave each of these tremendous actors an opportunity to show all the layers of what they bring to yeah. character. So that was one of my favorites. Yeah, I love that. Um, now, I know that Penelope and Lydia's relationship is definitely inspired by your relationship with your own parents. Where does your relationship with your parents and Lydia and Penelope's relationship overlap the most? Oh my gosh. Uh, religion. Yeah. Uh, you know, they're old school. My dad is still alive. He's very upset that he's dead on the show. He's very much alive. And when we got Tony Plana to play Ghost Tim, he was delighted because he loves Tony. Uh, but I, I would say religion. I'm a moderate. I'm in the middle. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm really in, in between. I, I recognize uh, wonderful things that the traditions and conservative uh, mindsets bring, but I also have that liberal side. So I feel really pulled mm -hmm. in, that, in those directions, like Penelope does. Right. Uh, so the conversations that we had about religion, the episode, I think it's episode three of season one, uh, No Mas, No Mass. Yeah, one of my favorite episodes. Yeah, that was, that's, that's a conversation I had with my parents. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Uh, is there a particular scene that is ripped straight from your life? There's so many scenes. Yeah. Where, look, the Mantilla <laughs> stuff, Mantilla is a piece of lace that you wear on your wedding day, and we have one that's been passed down okay. over the years. The Mantilla is missing. And it's a real drama. Yeah, that's a crisis. Okay, it's a crisis. <laughs> and uh, that was something that I was talking about in the room, and we were like, oh, what's, what are those great things that are so specific to family that doesn't matter to anyone else? And yeah. I'm like, oh, a piece of lace <laughs> that everyone's fighting about? How about that? So we did a whole episode about the mantilla. We've done, yeah, the religion stuff, the... Uh, so many, so many episodes. I love that. Now, Norman Lear, he's done several black shows that have had great success, like The Jeffersons, Good Times. Why do you think now was the perfect time to highlight a Latinx family? You know, he tried to do a Latinx show with Paul Rodriguez mm -hmm. called AKA Pablo okay. uh, in the 80s, I believe. And he just said the timing and, and the alchemy wasn't really there. Mm -hmm. I mean, there is sort of a magic that happens right. when you get the cast together, when you get a group together. Like, something sort of magical has to happen for it to take fire. And, and I think we just got really fortunate with Rita and Justina and, and this incredible cast. It was just lightning in a bottle, really. Yeah, absolutely. Now, tell me what fans can expect from season three. Are there any topics or issues that you haven't addressed over the first two seasons that's going to be new for season three? Well, we definitely do a Me Too episode. Okay. We also talk about pot, weed, uh, recreational use of marijuana, which is legal in California now. Not if you're under 18, which Alex is under 18, but we do get to talk about that. It's really interesting in Los Angeles because there's signs everywhere, like weed can be delivered to your house. Yeah. <laughs> and I think it's a mixed message for kids. I think they're like, wait, what is yeah, this? What's going on? What's going on? So we try to talk about that. And we continue to talk about PTSD, mental health, mm -hmm. anxiety, depression, homophobia. I mean, we really get in there. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> is, is there one fan reaction or piece of feedback that has meant a lot to you, I'm sure? I mean, for me, we do a lot of talks. We, do, we go around and we talk to various Latinx groups and LGBTQ groups and uh, veteran groups. And I think that when kids come with their parents or their grandparents and say, I was able to come out because of your show, forget it. And then you see um, parents really grateful that they have a tool with which to see themselves reflected and try to uh, come to a loving uh, end place with, with where their child is. I think that that... That is so meaningful. Yeah, that's awesome. Uh, last year, you started the One Vita at a Time campaign, mm -hmm. which challenged writers' rooms to stand against the family separation happening at the border. border. Yeah. Um, and then you also raised money for Races, which is the Refugee and Immigrant Center for Education and Legal Services. How did that idea come about? It was Tanya Siracho's idea. Tanya Siracho is the showrunner for Vida. She's a great friend of mine. We met doing Devious Maids. We okay. were the two Latinas there. And uh, she really had the idea. We were talking about how upset we were with what was happening, and we felt so 
powerless. Mm -hmm. And she said, you know, why don't we go to the scribes? Let's go to the writers. Let's challenge writers' rooms. This is not a partisan issue for us. It really is about uh, how do we treat people as a country when they come in. And uh, we got over 90 writers' rooms to come together and take photos saying, you know, family detention, keep families together, uh, you know, seeking asylum is not a crime, all of this, all of this, and we raised, uh, we raised some money. And so that felt like something. I mean, listen, yeah. it's tweeting, right? It's not, the action is the people at ISIS, the people at the border that are giving legal time and effort to these families, right. but um, it did feel like something that we could do with our platform. Yeah, definitely. Will the border crisis at all be reflected in season three, or is that something you've it's thought not, about? It's not in season three. I think we'll talk about it more in season four. Uh, we okay. weren't, I mean, the one thing, you know, Norman gets very frustrated because when he was doing the TV shows, he could write something and it'd be on the air the next week. Whereas we do 13 all at once, Not that so fast. we never know what's going to happen. Unfortunately, racism and homophobia, all that is, is still a problem. Yeah. We haven't solved it yet, you guys. Sadly. We're trying. <laughs> uh, so those are things that we knew, but we were really hoping that the border separation, that that would all be over. Yeah. And it's not. It's not, sadly. So, so season um, four. <laughs> yes, yeah, season four. Uh, if Donald Trump were to watch one day at a time, what would you hope his main takeaway would be from the show, or someone who even subscribes to his rhetoric about immigration? I hope that he would see that we are much more alike than we are different. And that if this was their child, I mean, I'm one generation removed from this. Mm -hmm. My parents came in 1962 from Cuba where uh, they sought asylum in the States and were welcome. So I cannot walk around not speaking up for these people because I am the direct uh, beneficiary of what this country does so beautifully. They took my parents in, they had a path to citizenship. I got to go to college. And now I'm writing a show about my family, and this is what I look like and how I sound. This is what one generation can do with the support of a country, which is what America does so beautifully. You will not meet more patriotic people than people who this country has been good to. And my parents are like out with that flag every chance they get. And so to see how different it is right now is really uh, painful because those children are going to grow up and have feelings about uh, what happened to them here. And, and I hope that, that there's a way that we can uh, remedy that. Yeah, absolutely. Now, even though the show does have serious moments, it really feels like a celebration of what it means to be a Latinx person. How do you make sure that's laced through each episode, even during the ones that are a little bit more serious and a little bit more heavy? I think, I mean, it's just infused in who we are, I yeah. think. So, you know, we're a comedy first and foremost. There are jokes. We are laughing. Uh, we just try to make each other laugh in the room, and we always try. It's called a treacle cutter. When you have an emotional moment, and you like cut it with something yeah. to make the audience laugh. We also shoot in front of a live audience, which is very rare these days. For yeah, TV definitely. Show. So the audience keeps us really honest. Like we can ride the waves. You can feel it. Mm -hmm. There's 250 people there every week. We're doing a play for, so you feel it, and you're like, oh, we got to give them a little laugh. We got to give them a little respite from this moment of, of seriousness. So we just we just try to balance that out. Right. Well, very well said. Thank you so much, Gloria, for being here. I really appreciate it. Thank and be you for sure, having me. of course, of course. <laughs> and be sure to watch season three of One Day at a Time streaming now on Netflix.